Hello and welcome to my YouTube podcast, where I've recently launched a new playlist dedicated to narrating long stories. In this episode, we explore a true story titled My Way Home, penned by Michael Golden. You're currently tuned in to the debut segment titled A Homeless Boy Age 14. For those interested in purchasing the book, you can find the link in the description below. Part 1 runs for approximately 10 minutes, so sit back, relax, pop in your earbuds, and hope you enjoy it. A Homeless Boy, Age 14, Part 1 2005 to 2006, school year. Can you spare any change? Not today! Can you spare any change? Sorry, I can't. Can you spare any change? No, please get away. Aimlessly, I wander down a busy street of downtown San Diego. Early September embraced me with an icy chill. I had a tattered black backpack on my back and a melted stone sneakers bar tucked in my right pocket for dinner. Sir, can you spare any change? I asked once more as I pressed forward. A slim man in a business suit smiled with pity as he dug deep into his pockets and handed me four quarters. Thank you, sir. God bless. He didn't respond. He kept walking as if we had no interaction at all. But being ignored is normal for me. The night air whipped under my thin black shirt. My master showed little remorse as it subdued me. I had no jacket, no sleeping bag, nothing except the clothes on my frail body. Transparent to the naked eye, I moved as a ghost. When I walked, no one noticed me. Maybe because my clothes were dirty, maybe because my shoes were from a donation box, or maybe because I embodied poverty. Whatever the reason, it made me invisible to everyone around me, except when my silhouette flickered from panhandling, frightening people. I moved along this street, headed toward a part of downtown where the homeless lined up close to the 12th and Imperial Trolley Station. I knew a guy named Rudy, who usually had a small tent set up outside and, if I was lucky, if he was still alive, I could crash there. I shivered from the wind. All of my panhandling efforts had made me only $2.45. I could not bring scraps back to my mom and sister. Spare any change? Get a job! Ma'am, I'm 14, I said back, but it didn't matter. She deleted me from her memory as soon as her eyesight left me. Spare any change? I asked another woman. Mike G? To my left came my friend, Ray, up the sidewalk. He had overheard me panhandling. The lady I had asked for money had stopped to dig in her purse. Keep going, lady. Ray shoot her away. Don't be out here begging these rich jerks for money, he scolded. I knew Ray from around town. Being 16 years old, he thought he had some authority over me. I have to eat, I shrugged. Ray eyed me and shook his head. You won't eat like that. Where are you going? Oh, I have no clue, bro. You know how it is. Yeah. I was leaving, but come with me. To where? Get you some money. From where? He trekked back down the street. I followed close behind. He turned down an alley and stood beside two hooded figures who shook his hand and tossing up their gang sign. I walked next to Ray, blown on my hands for warmth, waiting for money to magically appear. After a few minutes, a thin man in a tank top, faded blue jeans, and a mouth with sporadically missing yellow teeth came up to us. He handed Ray $20, and Ray placed a sandwich bag containing a crystalline white substance on the ground. I watched the entire transaction. The drug addict illuminated 
as he reached for the product. Then he disappeared out of the alley as quickly as he had appeared. Hell no! I moved away in a huff. Ray raced in front of me, cutting me off. Where do you think you're going? I'm out of here, I said. If the police don't get us, we're gonna get robbed or worse. Calm down, calm down. Ray revealed the barrel to the 38 caliber pistol he had stuffed in his waist belt. Nobody's robbing me. And I'm just trying to help your bum ass. I don't need this kind of hell, I said. The hell you don't. I can see your ribs, bro. You're like one of those xylophones. Ray exclaimed. Whatever, man, I'm not selling drugs. I keep telling you and Jason that I'll figure something out, I said. You mean you'll die? Right now, you don't have to sell anything. Just be the lookout. I'll make a few more transactions and give you food money. Relax, bro. It's easy money. Ray declared. I deeply inhaled, then exhaled. Crack cocaine hit America hard and swept through the inner city, crippling most of the minority families before my birth. I had seen it my entire life and wanted no part of it. The nationwide epidemic was just another means to an end. Crazy. I brushed past Ray and marched to the end of the alley. Just whistle if you see something. <laughs> Ray chuckled. I leaned against the alley wall on patrol. The promise of food lured me and stopped me from leaving. I knew it was wrong, but if I left, where would I go? There is no telling whether Rudy and his tent were still there. After about an hour and endless foot traffic from the alley, I grew impatient. By now, Ray had to have made enough money for me to at least go to McDonald's. I followed another addict into the alley as he strolled up to Ray. Ray slyly flashed a small stack of cash he reserved for me. He gave a head nod, acknowledging the time came to go. As the attic limped over toward Ray's friends, and Ray began walking toward me, the attic handed one of Ray's friends money, and Ray's friend directly handed the attic a sack of crack cocaine. Police! Freeze! The attic grabbed Ray's friend's wrist, as he flashed a badge. Two police cars abruptly blockaded the alley entrance. Shit! I said. Ray, his other friend, and I darted toward the opposite end of the alleyway. I sped past the window. Ray was the only This marks the end of part one. Please give it a thumbs up and share this video as we are currently fundraising for the homeless through this content. Stay tuned for the next part.